So I titled my talk Six Numbers, and I'm going to give you six numbers. Here they are, 20, 50, 5,024, 9,205, 8,388, and 500. I will tell you what these numbers are in the course of the talk. <laughs> so here's the basic problem for trying to get mechanism from fMRI. Um, you've got measurements, fMRI measurements, which are indirect signals of local changes in blood oxygenation in small voxels or cubic regions, um, typically two millimeters or so, uh, during a cognitive task or at rest. And from this, you're supposed to infer what we're going to call the causome, the causal relationships between these regions performing that task. And we, we use the word causome rhetorically to distinguish ourselves from the connectome, which is a common, commonly used word in fMRI, uh, which is simply an, in, an undirected graph over the, over the regions. Now, why do you want to do this? Well, for one thing, by contrasting the mechanisms where there is a task to rest mechanisms where there is no task, you might get information about causal relationships that are specific to a specific task or uh, kind of cognitive task. And from this, you might hope to, uh, to uh, you hope this would lead to a, a refinement of your understanding of neuropsychology, a, uh, a, an idea of how cognitive tasks align with neural processes, and how uh, you might be able to identify disturbances for neuroatypicals. So some typical task experiments. Uh, here, here are just a few. These are from data sets from Russ Poldrack's open fMRI project, which is completely open, of, open to, the, to use for, for public uh, for consumption. Um, experiment one, subjects inflate balloons and judge whether to keep inflating them. It's a risk experiment. Experiment three, subjects judge nonsense words as rhyming or not. And experiment five, subjects are given a stake and bets with real money, which they can accept or reject. We're going to talk about experiments one and three. So the usual procedure is to get bold time series for the whole cortex or part or the whole brain, um, and then to cluster the time series into regions of interest or ROIs by using anatomy or statistical clustering or eyeballing. And eyeballing is used a lot. Uh, then to aggregate the bold measurements for at, at a time for voxels within clusters into single measurements, uh, say the average of, over the cluster or the first principal component over the cluster, to get a time series for each ROI or, or cluster, and then to apply a search procedure to estimate the causal relationships among the clusters. Now here are some, here's an example of some clustering that was done for experiment three in some work that we've done. Uh, we have I, which is an input variable. Right there. And that's on or off, depending on whether the task condition holds or does not. And it's convolved with a hemodynamic response function, which is a curve that, that shows how, how a neural signal evolves over time in terms of its bold effect. You go up, and then you go down under the, un, you dip down underneath the, the, the zero line, and then you go back to zero. And uh, I'll mention later that there, there are timing problems, and the timing problems relate to how long it takes for that curve to go up and reach its maximum. And then we have a number of regions of interest. So these are the, 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 uh, the, the, the guys in red here are highly correlated with the task variable. The guys that are not in red are not. It's been thresholded. And after thresholding, it's been clustered into various regions which have been identified with their approximate anatomical uh, area. Uh, blood oxygen level dependent. Um, and then we've, we've applied the images algorithm, which is one of the causal search al algorithms you could apply. I think Catherine's going to talk about that a little more too. Uh, and we've gotten over nine regions where there are no missing values. Uh, we've gotten that the input variable is causally uh, exogenous to the uh, left auxiliary uh, cortex variable, and that goes into the right occipital. And you can see that there's a cascade up the left hemisphere 
with projections into the right. And that accords with expert knowledge. So what all search procedures could you use? Well, here's a list of search procedures that have been used in one way or another. Some of these have been talked about already during the conference. Uh, one is to just guess. <laughs> and honest to God, this is used a lot. Uh, they're educated guesses, but they're guesses. Uh, you'd like something more principled. Well, one thing people reach for whenever they want something more principled is the inverse covariance or partial correlation. And I'll talk about that in a second. Another thing is PC algorithm, which we've used a lot. FCI algorithm, which has been used uh, to an extent. Uh, GES and images, which have been used in the literature. Granger causality, which has been used a lot. The Lingham algorithm, which has been used to an extent. Um, and li the Lizrell algorithm, uh, or the Gimme algorithm, which has, been, which has shown some, some promise in recent <coughs> years. Uh, finally, there are orientations using non-Gaussian scores. And there's an algorithm due to Friston, which I'll talk about. Uh, so the guess method is you look at the ROIs and the data, and you guess what the causal connections are. That's really all there is to it. Like I said, it's used. Um, inverse covariance, I want to mention this in particular. Uh, the idea is that you, you calculate the covariance matrix of your data, and then you invert it, possibly with an L1 penalty. Or you estimate the inverse covariance matrix directly without calculating the covariance matrix first. Um, but you get the inverse covariance matrix. And then the zero entries are where x is independent of y conditional on z, where z is all the other variables. Now, what's the problem with this? This, this method is used a lot. What's the problem with this? It's a simple problem of deseparation. If you have x and error z back arrow y, where z is a child of x and y, then you have that x and z X and, X and Y are uncorrelated unconditionally on Z, but if you conditional on Z, they're correlated. So you end up with an extra edge where there's no edge in the true model. In other words, you're marrying the parents. So, uh, so that's one way to get extra edges in the graph. Another way to get extra edges in the graph is to simply threshold the covariance matrix. And again, this is a, a widely used method in fMRI to just simply uh, threshold the covariance matrix. Now, what's the problem with that? Well, if you have x arrow y arrow z, uh, then you have x being correlated with z. Uh, so you get an edge x to z. Now, granted, this edge x to z is going to be weaker than the edge x to y or y to z uh, in general. So if you set the threshold high enough, you're, it's going to disappear from your graph. But nevertheless, theoretically, it should be there. So how can you avoid these problems? Well, one way to avoid these problems is to run the PC algorithm, which uh, assumes that the true model is a directed acyclic graph, assumes there are no unrecorded common causes, and that you have IID sampling, and under these assumptions, um, uh, finds an adjacency graph with correct adjacencies, unlike the, the two previous methods. And this adjacency method works well for fMRI and scales up to high dimensional problems, as we'll see. Uh, now, you can also get orientations from this method. For, P, for fMRI, the orientations do not work very well. Uh, so it's mainly the adjacencies we're looking at for fMRI. Um, PC can, can process multiple subjects using a multi-subject conditional independence test. The one that works pretty well for fMRI uh, that I've found is you just uh, do regress x uh, for, for x independent of y conditional on z. You regress x onto z, y onto z get the regression residuals for each, aggregate those over subjects, and then calculate a partial correlation over the aggregated residuals, and then calculate Fisher's Z from there. Another algorithm you could use is FCI, which is like PC but does not assume that there are no unmeasured common causes, so there may be latent variables. Um, it uses the same adjacency search as PC, but the adjacencies are interpreted differently. Not all of them represent direct causal paths. Uh, does not scale up to high, high dimensions, but a modification, RFCI, uh, due to people in this room, uh, does scale up much faster. Uh, how much better? We don't know. We haven't, we haven't really tried to scale it up yet. I haven't really tried to scale it up yet. Uh, then we have GES and images. GES uh, 
is a Bayesian score search under essentially the same assumptions as PC, correct, in the large sample limit. Images is a multi-subject version of GES where you average the BSC scores. And there's a penalty term to account for problems of measurement. <laughs> and it scales up so-so. I'll mention that later. Granger causality asks whether variables, um, ask whether you can, you can condition on variables in the, in the past to better predict variables in the future. For instance, if you regress y of t onto x of x to, onto the various x sub i's at t minus 1 and y at t minus 1, and then you take the significant x predictors to be the causes of y, that would be equivalent to Granger causality. And here the lags are critically important for this method. In particular, it is important that the lags be uniform across the data set, a condition which doesn't hold well for fMRI data. And this is the problem I was mentioning earlier. You have, if you have this function that, that, that's showing how, how the reaction of the bold signal uh, to, the, to, the, to the neural signals uh, evolves over time. In different parts of the brain, that, that reaches its maximum at different times. So this is just a problem of getting the time series to have a uniform lag. And some work has been done on this to adjust for this problem. Uh, I don't know how, how good it is yet. Uh, Lingham, this is a linear non-Gaussian acyclic model. This has already been mentioned in the, in the, in the, in the conference. Uh, it runs independent components analysis, associates ICA, ICA that is, associates ICA output with variables by reordering the matrix into a lower triangle and infers causal connections and directions in one fell swoop. I'll comment on that a bit later. Um, there's this more recent method that uses the Lizrel uh, program. It's called GIMI. I'll, I'll defer on this. Kathleen Gates will talk about this. Uh, basically, it models the causal structure over our ROIs as a linear Gaussian system. And in just in judging outputs that we've, that we've looked at, it seems to be very effective at the non -station, for non-stationary connections for a reason I don't completely understand. Uh, that is, for when the coefficient for the x error y edge is changing over time. Now, given adjacencies, you can use non-Gaussian scoring to uh, effectively orient edges. And we've done this in a variety of ways. There are some algorithms due to Shivarnan and Smith that estimate the direction between x and y from skews. For instance, x squared y minus y squared x. Other methods due to Ramsey et al. Um, R1 and R2 assume that the sums of independent variables are closer to Gaussian than the summons. This is not universally true, but we assume that it's generally true. R3 uses an information theoretic measure based on non-Gaussian Gaussianity scores. So this is a method based on entropy. Um, R4 adapts an independent components analysis for cyclic graphs, uh, namely the Ling algorithm, to the conditions of fMRI. And that's a, that's able on, that's, that seems to be able to infer two cycles. Um, now this Friston method I want to talk about, this is in the context of dynamic causal modeling, which is uh, one of the main paradigms in the literature. Uh, for modeling fMRI data. Um, he proposes a uh, method that scores a series of models and reports the model with the best score. And this is possible due to a very fast scoring procedure, which is a work of genius in my view. It's very fast. Um, however, the number of possible models over the set of variables increases super exponentially. Uh, so only models with a very few number of variables can be considered, say up to five variables, and that's it. Uh, or six or seven, and that's really the limit. Um, so I just want to highlight the, this problem here of the difference between exhaustive search and, and search more generally. Exhaustive search goes through every single model of a certain sort and is limited in the size of models it can, it can approach. Uh, search, for example, PC search uh, is able to by eliminating edges from all the models, it's able to reduce the model space very quickly and, 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 and scale up much better. So how do you test these methods? Well, you do a lot of simulations, then you torture animals, and you measure humans. <laughs> <laughs> Basic method of testing. <laughs> so one torture test by Dawson et al. 
uh, compared causal relationships between visual cortex regions of the macaque monkeys with causal relationships between analogous areas in the human cortex, estimated by several search methods from fMRI. And in this case, only the ident adjacencies were identified, not the directions. And the PC was the most accurate uh, out of the algorithms. Now, there's lots of simulation data. There's this big study by Smith et al. Um, that tested identifications of simple graphical causal relationships from simulated fMRI in 28 conditions. Uh, Smith et al. tested 35 search methods, none succeeded at identifying causal directions accurately. Uh, their code, due to Smith and Woolrich mainly, based on the best available bi biophysical model of the generation of bold signals, can be used to simulate data for much more complicated higher dimensional models, which I'll talk about too. Uh, study conclusions that the BayesNet methods, PC, GES, FCI, CCD, were effective at finding adjacencies. Inverse covariance methods were also effective at finding adjacencies because there were only a few unshielded colliders in the Smith models. And Granger methods and all versions tested were ineffective at finding adjacencies, but are still frequently used in the literature. If you go to conferences, you'll see about half the posters are on Granger causality methods. Um, and Lingham was completely ineffective at finding adjacencies. Lingham did not work for fMRI at all. Uh, and finally, no methods were effective at finding orientations. Non-Gaussian methods, uh, other, no non-Gaussian methods other than Lingham were tested, but I'll add a, add a, a codicil, except maybe there's a, there's a method called Patel, which we've recently discovered was actually a non-Gaussian method, and it actually did the best at orientation out of all the methods considered. So 20 is the maximum number of variables in any published attempt at causal inference in the empirical fMRI data. And that was due to Friston. I have 16. <laughs> 16. <laughs> Hold it. <laughs> I'll edit that. We hear seven. <laughs> All right. Uh, what was 50 was the number of simulated graphs in the largest simulation model in the Smith study. Maybe you have something higher. So here's the structure of these Smith models. Um, you have these little stars. You have uh, influence going around the circle to the right with an edge from this guy back to that guy. And you have uh, copies of those being made um, in various conditions. This is the 50 node simulation. And uh, you have basically 10 stars uh, that are connected up with stars and with edges. Uh, and for later, we'll talk about a 500 variable case, which will be an extension of that. You'll have uh, more of these 25 uh, variable uh, constructions connected together with edges. But then here, there are many unshielded on either side. Well, they're, very, they're, they're relatively few. So it's just right here and right there. So for each of these stars, there's one. It goes in. Yeah. There's a collider. No? <coughs> No, no. There, there's there's one collider within within each star, and then when a guy goes between stars, that creates. A no, I said in, when the external inputs go in. No, they're not there. Oh, okay, thank you. Yeah, we don't have any external. Well, I have another comment about this model. If you take the data from this model and compute covariance, you actually see the structure. You see the stars, the blocks, and uh, like. You almost see those cross stars uh, connections. Like, well, those are five, uh, like they call them stars. Well, but what do you mean? What do you mean? Compute the covariance. Just take the data, compute the covariance, and display it as a matrix. You see the structure. It's like very easy uh, data for anything. The threshold, the threshold for covariance. Oh, you don't threshold anything. Just look at the covariance. Visually, you see the structure. That's the first method, right? The visual method. Could the speaker speak and we can have the argument? No, this is fine. fine. <laughs> um, 5,024 is the number of six millimeter voxels in the cortex. So these are two millimeter voxels which have been upsampled to six millimeter voxels. Uh, this is our current target. 
Nine is, was the number of variables in the graphical causal model estimated by the poll drag for the pseudorime experiment, which I showed you. So you can see there's quite a, a jump in the number of variables that we're aiming to consider. 9,205, if, if, if you run PC on the, on the covariance matrix for, experiment, for one, of the, one of the subjects uh, in experiment one for one of the runs, um, you get that many edges. Uh, that's for the alpha of 0 0.01. And we're orient using the, the, the method R3 uh, to get orientations for those. And then the question is how good that is. So that's an that's a, that's a issue of, of, of research. As, as a side note, GES and images, I've actually gotten GES to scale up to 800 or 1,000 variables, um, which compared to it, it, the previous scale up is quite a, quite a jump. But I have not been able to get it to scale up to 5,024. 8,388 is the number of directed edges for one single subject data set from experiment three. Alpha is 0.05 in this case. Um, calculate the covariance matrix over, the, over the, all the voxels. Run PC and then orient using R3. Uh, many, and notice in this case, there are many unrecorded voxels. So maybe we should run R RFCI in the future if we can get it to scale up that far. Um, 500 is the number of variables that we've been able to scale the Smith simulation up to. Um, so why trust these estimates in general? One point is that the simulation with 500 variables with a Smith code yields 90% precision, 50% recall. Point two is that in experiment three, PC plus R3 identifies the stimulus variable as a cause, not as an effect of neural variables. So that's one piece of information that we know for sure should be the case, that the input variable should be exogenous. And point three, in experiment three, PC plus R3 agrees with experts' opinions of directions of influence, that it's, it's a cascade of the left hemisphere with projections into the right. And here's some details for the 500 variable sim simulation. Um, parse this for you. AP is adjacency precision. So this is a precision of adjacencies. Uh, it's 0.94 across the board. We use the same PC output for all the orientations. And 0.49 is the adjacency recall. Uh, and that's across the board. And then we get various uh, precisions restricted to the true adjacencies. So that's the, that's the PTPA. And some of, the, some of these, this is like 0 0.76, 0 0.94, 0 0.75. These are very, very high, 0 0.96 and point. These are the Kivarnan and Smith methods. They do quite well. Patel does quite well. SQE does quite well. RSQE, these are just various methods that we've used. So these are averages over five subjects. Um, these are for, for the group whenever we analyze the group altogether. The adjacency precision jumps to 0 0.98 from 0.94. And it's 0.98 across the board. And the recall jumps to 1 across the board uh, when we analyze them as a group. And the, the PTPA jumps into the, into the, from here from 0.76 to 0.99. And, and these, are all, these all become 1s. So it, it, for the group, it, if, we, if we could analyze, if we could justify analyzing at a, at a group level, we could actually do quite well. But, we stick to the, to the single subject level since that's what we know. <coughs> so how is this possible? We use PC for adjacencies, non-Gaussian scores for directions, and the programming challenges are to scale everything up to 5,054 variables. This seems doable for PC for, with non-Gaussian orientation. Uh, whether it's doable for RFCI is, is an open question. Whether I can uh, manage to get GES to scale up that far is an open question still. Uh, whether there are other algorithms that will, that will scale up that far uh, remains to be seen. I'm sure there are some in the literature that, that can scale up that far currently, and, and we'll, we'll seek them down and try them. Uh, this is not the limit of aspiration. We want to go to 40,000 voxels or so. This would be a 3.2 millimeter uh, voxel, for, uh, uh, or even higher. If we could get down to 2 millimeter, that would, be, that would be even better. Probably we'll need a supercomputer for that. All, all, all these others are done on my, on my MacBook Air. Uh, why the low recall for single subjects? 
Well, with PC, there's a trade-off between computational complexity and information retrieved. The choice is to find the largest effect effects only or to have the computer never return. Um, there's a little more to it than that. That for PC is a choice of alpha level. Higher alpha levels imply more false positive edges, and the sample size is very small for single subjects. So what are the problems? Well, we have stability of PC under resampling. Uh, we have disagreements and estimates from different non-Gaussian scoring procedures. So either you have to pick the best one or somehow combine them. Disagreements and estimates between subjects. So if you run one subject and then get adjacencies and you run another subject, subject uh, do you get radically different adjacencies or not? That's something that has to be investigated. And also feedback relations addressed in one non-Gaussian method, R4, whether there are other methods that can, that can analyze feedback relations as well uh, remains to be seen for this. Cancellation of correlations of, of, by positive and negative influences. So PC, if you, if you ask, uh, if you have a, a method where x is, er, x, we have an x into y and y into x, and the co coefficient for x into y is a, and the coefficient for y into x is minus a, then those two exactly cancel each other, and PC will conclude that there's no edge there. So the question is whether or not you can find a, a method that will discover those edges, even, the even if you have uh, opposing um, uh, ne 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 negated coefficients for, for the different directions. Uh, latent variables is a big problem. It's just, it just goes without saying that there are going to be latent variables. I mean, if you're measuring all the voxels in the brain, you might assume that you, you got a good fair amount of the variables that you need to do the analysis. But there might be other variables, such as uh, heart rate and things like that, that, that still stand out as latent variables in the, in the, in the method. Uh, and non-stationary time series, like again, uh, we're very optimistic about GIMI at this point. But there may be other methods for handling that as well. Uh, potential clinical applications, hopefully Catherine will talk about this. <laughs> I haven't seen your talk. <laughs> and thanks to, thanks to many people, uh, more than are on this list. I just want to list a few. This is our 500 variable uh, Smith simulation graph, oh, which we've overlaid on the brain. So most of the uh, serious cognitive neuroscientists I know can rarely think about more than five areas of the brain. At the same time. <laughs> so why do we want to scale this up to 40,000? <laughs> In other words, who's, who's going to interpret that? What do we want to do with that? I mean, I have an answer. <coughs> well, it's so, it's so, Clark, 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 is, Clark, is, Clark is waiting to answer this. Yeah. <laughs> He's putting words in my mouth. If we build it, they will. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but you see the point, the problem with most cognitive neuroscientists is it's going to be very hard for us to look at that and say, OK, I kind of understand what's going on here, because you know I really don't know what the circuit is for risk aversion and gambling or smoking. Most of them think anything else they do. <laughs> so it's a structural issue, I guess. It's a structural issue. Yeah, so, so at this point, it's a structural yeah. issue, just to see if we can do it, yeah. to see if we can get stable results out. And then if we can, to see whether they, the, the psychological tasks divvy up the, the, the edges in the graph into those that are relevant to a particular task and those that are not. So be, there has to be some way to map that functional layer back into this. That's right. Somehow. That's right. So that's a piece that's kind of missing. In that's a piece that's missing now. We will do that. Fair enough. Yeah. Good. Can you say a little bit more about how I'm supposed to think about ground truth here for the, I can obviously see it in the simulation, <coughs> but uh, in the real data, if you could go messing around in the brain in whichever way you would like, what would, what would count as a kind of verification of the uh, models that you get us? Well, I mean, 
if you could uh, interfere with the signal at some point and see what the effects of the interference are, that would that would certainly count. It's a do you have to interfere in a specific way or in any way? I mean, the, the variables you have are aggregates of presumably lots and lots of neurons that are where the causal work is occurring. So, so you have to have an interference on the aggregate. Right. And that's, that's the only thing I can think of at the moment. I don't, I don't see how you can interfere with particular in humans with particular neurons or particular voxels. Uh, in such a way as to illustrate what the, what the, what the upshot of, of that would be. But we can interfere with aggregates. We've got you know, transcranial trans magnetic. I guess I'm not worried so much about what we can physically do at the moment, but how to conceptually think about this. So, so, but you would say, if I could intervene on a bunch of neurons individually that are in that aggregate, then I can characterize the type of intervention that I would want to be doing such that I can investigate this higher level graph. Yeah, I mean that that that's that's so for instance in the in the Dawson et al. study, they, they, they actually take macaques and they actually open up their their skulls. <laughs> <laughs> and they put electrodes. <laughs> and, and so so they actually have that kind of data. It's, it's not at the voxel level. It's at the level of region inside of V4. Um, so they subdivide V4 into nine regions, and they interfere with one of those regions at a time. Um, but at the voxel level, I, I, don't, I don't actually know how we can get uh, ground truth at this point. Um, that, that's, that's pretty small. So I guess our, 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 our current goal is to be able is to see if we can analyze it first and get a result. So I mean, uh, diffusion denser imaging, although it doesn't give you orientation, would give you hopefully a, a superset of the anatomical, the adjacencies. And so if you really were outside of that, and you're doing a specific task, let's say some kind of memory task, so you're looking at medial temporal. <coughs> <laughs> you can do some kind of you know, convergence analysis. Say, oh, I'm here. This area actually is more perturbed than that area. Uh, this, this is also a, obviously a clinical population which Catherine goes through in terms of being able to identify voxel level changes. Right. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, but generally, I mean, TMS. It, you know, so, so if you targeted frontal areas, that would be interesting to see if the graph, you know, sort of destabilized. So if you're in a car accident, you get, you know, your acceleration, deacceleration, you're basically knocking your frontal lobes into the skull, and this produces traumatic brain injury. So you could simulate something like that, and, and there are a, a clear effects on memory, language, and, and a number of other functions we have that we'd like to do. <coughs> I'm still trying to understand fMRI at, at a level which helps me understand what results are possible. Um, and like, is there a temporal unfolding of, of activity of regions, or is it that basically you see a certain set of regions light up and that you don't have a sense of temporal order to that activity? So for each region of interest, we've got a time series. Right. So you can see where the signals are going up and where they're going down okay, and what so, and what so you region. do have a sense that it goes up here and then and then yes there is a there is a there is a sense there is a sense okay. um, so the question is so one question is a lot of these methods are assuming that the data are iid so in that if you're assuming that the data are iid you're assuming that the temporal order doesn't matter and the, there's a qu real question as to the extent to which that assumption holds and it seems to hold well enough for these methods to work, uh, which is interesting. So in that case, wouldn't a possible evaluation technique be to find some experiment which 
which initially activate certain regions and then say, what cascade of other regions would I expect <coughs> to see given the causal graph? It's that, a new experiment that hasn't, you haven't seen before. Yeah, that, that, that would be interesting. You could actually do that with, if you did the whole brain analysis. If you're, if you're going to pick regions in advance, then you don't know whether there's some, some guy over here that lights up right. just transiently. So <clears throat> I have a question about, uh, about aggregation, which I think you've heard before, but I'm curious to know. <coughs> so <coughs> Sergey's comment about using just co covariance to detect the adjacencies notwithstanding. I take it you get a big gain at a, you know, at adjacency detection by considering conditional independence information, not just independence. We do. Right. So what you're doing is you're aggregating activity over lots and lots of neurons within a region. Right? And then you're computing conditional independence relations among aggregate activities. That's right. So we know that unless the relations among the neurons are linear, right. we lose conditional independence when we do that. Right. But you're not losing conditional independence here, so do you have an explanation for why this works? Uh, yes. Not yet. I'm just going to keep asking. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, not yet. I mean, we could try nonlinear. So that's, there's another thing. There are, there are nonlinear non Gaussian independence tests, um, which well, don't explain why your linear ones work. Right. <laughs> so. <clears throat> I know nothing about this, so the, the, it seems to me that the, the, for someone who knows nothing about this, the way to approach it would be you could stimulate the axon externally with a wire or something, <laughs> while under the FMI and watch to see if you can see the propagation of activation, right, like as he suggested. But, and that's something which you could do reproducibly again and again to cut out any you know, possible noise, you know, other. <coughs> is that not, if somebody probably has done that with monkeys and rats or something. Like that. <laughs> 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 but a volunteer probably. Yeah, right. <laughs> but I mean, is that not, uh, and then because the speed well, of, of propagation of this should somehow correlate with the with, uh, diffusion rate of, of neurotransmitters or something. Yeah, so so the, the, the main problem with, yeah. with doing that is that the speed of propagation mm -hmm. is on the order of like, 100 milliseconds. Okay. And the rate of measurement for fMRI is on the order of like two to three seconds. <laughs> so by the time everything is propagated out, you will have involved the entire brain, probably. Marlish. I have one. Have you actually tried RFCI? I have not. Okay, okay. That's what I keep saying. Uh -huh. I but it's a similar speed than PC, so it should probably work. But for the adjacencies, I think it won't matter much. You might lose maybe a few edges, but not much, probably. Huh. For the orientations, uh, you might get less informative, right? Or you yeah. might get more don't know information. Yeah. All right. And another question I had is, have you tried permuting your variables and see what happens to the output? I, I have not yet. Okay. It, it takes a long time to run one of these things. Uh -huh. So <laughs> I have to set up and really focus on permuting things. We've also tried PC stable. These are all PC stable results. Ah, okay. so, <laughs> so I'm stealing from you. <laughs> okay. uh, this is a naive question, too. So, uh, in, in your social science applications in the book, uh, I noticed that a lot of time temporal order does the orientation. <coughs> I'm wondering why there has to be a total absence of temporal order information. In there, there doesn't. This graph. This graph used temporal order. So for images, images is, returns a pattern. Um, and so using the temporal order actually helps. So we, we, we just assume that the input is prior to all the other variables. And, uh, and as a result, we get this, that, that's how that cascade comes out. Now what's interesting is that if you, if you don't orient using temporal order, but using some non-Gaussian method, you get very much for, me, for mo many of the methods, you get a very similar kind of cascade. Uh, there may be differences in an edge or two, but, but you still get it. And for a, a number of the methods, you actually get eyes still being exogenous to lock. So 
you, you can do it either way. Can I ask a, just a, a quick one? Why, why did you say that uh, PC, do you know why PC doesn't orient well? <coughs> why it doesn't orient well? I mean, I have ideas as to why PC might not orient well. Uh, the idea is, so say you want to, I mean, this is just my general, Peter may disagree with me on this, but say that I have X independent of Y conditional on some set Z1, Z2, Z3. Uh, it could be that the independence, you, you find, you falsely find an independence for X independent of Y conditional on Z1 and Z2 without the Z3. And then whenever you go to orient, you're, you're playing on whether that Z3 is in the conditioning set or not. So you, you, you basically, your, your, your test has to be so accurate that you get exactly the right conditioning set for your for your for your independence in each case. So that that seems to be the, the basic problem with this kind of data. Yeah. One more question, Jeff? Yeah. So uh, can you explain how long it took to run PC on five thousand variables? I'm sorry, could you start again? How long did it take to run PC on five thousand variables and what's the maximum size of conditioning set did you use? I used the maximum size of three and I ran it in about two minutes. two minutes. Yeah. It's extremely sparse, right? It's extremely sparse. How many edges were you This 5,000? How many edges? Between 7 and 9,000. I mean, it depends on what I set the alpha level to. Obviously, if I set the alpha level very small, it would be much, much lower, maybe like 4,000 edges.